Yes, one at the back. Darren Richards. Hello, hello. Darren Richards from Cogent Consulting. Um, it's a question for Ian, really. Do you remember something called the Challenge Fund? No? Okay, 50, 60 something million that was given to the offsite industry by the government specifically to close that gap on finance. Do you, do you ever see anything like that coming down the tracks? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's really interesting. The, the Department for Communities and Local Government um, is hugely interested in understanding just what the barriers are to being able to bring forward greater capacity. It, it's a, I think it's a slightly difficult one where the most recent indications are that there are some quite significant entrants into the market who are prepared to invest in production. What really interests me about it is we seem to have quite a large number of smaller scale existing, smaller scale manufacturers who, if they had the pipeline, could ramp up production very significantly. Um, I'm, I'm personally really keen to talk directly to people running those companies and organizations and, and really understanding the barriers that they face. Um, and I think across, across government, a, you know, a joined up approach, particularly with um, Department of Business Innovation and Skills who have invested in supporting greater capacity, you know, it, it really would be good to see some direct financial incentives that could be crafted to boost um, to, to, to boost the profitability of the sector, you know, to increase capacity. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Yes, down here on my left. We started the ball rolling. That's fantastic. Hi, uh, Mike Goddard from ODC Glass Systems. This is a message for Chris, really. Um, How's, with all the information we've gone about modular building and obviously the growth that's been put forwards on the, uh, to the region, how's we going to be supporting uh, off-site and obviously the growth in the residential sector? Um, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting one, actually. The, the, the majority of the input, I'm, I, th I think I'm not a great advocate of pure modular off-site construction. I'm, I'm more of an advocate of, of absolute efficiency. Uh, and to my mind, construction sites are there to be built by people with the best tools that they have in their uh, toolbox. And if the best tools they have in their toolbox can be found in uh, Manchester or Cardiff or Turkmenistan or the United States, then we can get them and bring them across and bolt them into the building. Um, I don't like to see lots of waste. And actually, I'm a great advocate of a construction industry that has people in it that are skilled craftspeople that do the job. Now, where, as far as Buig are concerned, the, the biggest opportunity we have in this, interestingly enough, is the work we're doing on Hinkley Point and the work we're doing on the arena. Both of those projects, because they're sizable, are attracting a far larger um, emphasis on what they have to do locally and what we have to leave behind when, when we leave those sites. And it's unfortunately, it's the smaller sites and the res residential ones spe spe specifically that are much more difficult to try and work on. And I think it's a bigger scale thing. It certainly isn't a, a Boeing alone problem. It's an industry problem. We can play a part on the big projects. Um, and I say play a part because the team at Hinkley Point, <coughs> Jamie's here somewhere, the team at Hinkley Point has done enormous amount of work to make sure that the community in, around Hinkley Point are heavily involved in the process. One of the reasons we're talking to Bristol on the arena is because of the commitment we've made to actually drive what we leave behind as being more than just hopefully a brilliant arena. We want to drive behind, leave behind something that actually says that the Bristol actually benefited and the, the whole enterprise zone actually benefited from having an arena that we happen to build. It's much easier on the bigger projects. It's much more complicated on the smaller projects. And therefore, the industry needs to come together as a whole to work out how we deliver. I mean, some of the ideas that Ian was talking about, they're, they're, they're fantastic. I think the architecture on the Hoff houses is, uh, is amazing, but we can't all afford one of those. We've got to try and get the point where we can be really cutting-edge technology into an industry that makes interesting houses rather than the sort of monstrosities that we would have been more used to and the sort of post-war modularization, which was needed for a reason. People won't live in those kind of houses anymore. They need something that's a little bit more architecturally 
significant, a little bit more exciting, I think, and frankly, they deserve it. We have the technology in the industry these days to be far more interesting. But it isn't a one company, organi a one company issue. It's not going to be something we're going to set up a, an, uh, something to actually go and build lots of houses in a certain way. It's going to be an industry issue to try and solve that particular one. Where we can get more involved there is unfortunately the bigger projects because you have to be um, involved in a wider community, otherwise you simply can't build the project. Okay, anyone else? Yes, on the far right. Sorry to make you do this. <coughs> you won't have to go to the gym tonight now. Um, my name's uh, Tim Jones. So it's probably a question for Ian, I guess, but maybe the, the rest of the panel as well. Um, um, the, all the speakers have talked about skills shortages. Um, perhaps um, you, Ian, um, were being diplomatic in not necessarily talking about that issue, but um, in the world uh, of the far southwest, the world uh, of delivering construction projects through DMB may be now dead because of the risk uh, of obtaining the requisite skills. Um, we talked about this problem for as long as I can remember, certainly the last five years when we lost whatever it was, 300,000 out of the construction industry. Um, we still haven't really got an answer to this. Now, um, the, the three from the construction industry um, who've got to wrestle with this issue have all got their own in-house programs, apprenticeships, and so on and so forth. The HCA, however, have got this huge charge to deliver uh, a million new homes. Um, where, Ian, are the Department of Education in this, and how can we start leveraging that sector so that we really get hold of this problem? Because otherwise, it's going to be with us for the next five years. Just respond with a, a, a couple of points. Um, one of the companies I didn't mention who are investing even more heavily in off-site manufacturer, Wilmot Dixon, um, and their whole uh, ethos for expanding their involvement in off-site manufacture is based on their desire to future-proof themselves from construction skills shortages, which I find a, a, a really interesting um, position from a company who are you know, very actively engaged in the industry. If you read research relating to the off-site manufacturer, um, if I were to summarize it, and I, I don't want to be too simplistic, but um, uh, what it says is a, a significant growth in the use of off-site manufacture in the UK may have a positive impact in reducing the need for um, certain levels of sort of standard on-site construction skills, but it significantly ramps up the requirement for more specialist engineering um, uh, skills in terms of uh, the, the provision. So whatever way you look at it, we have a, we have a, a construction skills uh, difficulty. Um, when I worked for the RDA, we spent an inordinate amount of money supporting skills in the Southwest, and we had a whole series of funds and, and, and funded colleges and organizations with the resources necessary to, to directly build skills in different sectors, including the construction sector. Unfortunately, where we stand now is all government funding that is um, uh, pumped through the HCA is capital funding to fund the delivery of projects. We have no access to resources to directly support some of the skills initiatives that I think are really needed to, um, to, to, to protect uh, our needs in the Southwest. And I look at the same group of partners who I would have been working with when I was at the Southwest RDA and I able to support them with funding, trying desperately to meet the skills gap and provide the necessary support and training, but with much less um, uh, support from, from, from any public sector direction. So I think it is a key issue, and I personally would love to see um, a greater commitment to skills funding within the construction sector. Because if you look at the numbers I've just shown you, um, by any stretch of the imagination, we are going to face absolutely swinging difficulties finding the skilled labour to construct those homes. 
Would anyone else on the panel like to make a comment on skills? Because it is probably the number one issue that comes into my box, I entry box. I was going to add a, a very a, a quick comment. I think from a, from a me perspective, we need to be very careful not to rely on central government to come up with a fancy way of, uh, of educating people to be in this industry. Um, I think central government's job is to find a way of allowing us to build. Uh, I think it's the industry's job to find the people that actually want to build and make the industry more attractive to people coming out of, of, of frankly, primary school so they actually look at construction as a viable option for them. A lot of the kids coming up at sort of year nine and ten, I did a careers fair not long ago and hardly any of them really understood what the construction industry did. That's not an indictment on the government, that's an indictment on us. So I think we work, need to work as a team generally to actually make this industry look a little bit more exciting, look at, make the prospects more exciting and make people actually want to go, I think I want to join that industry. And that's from, from, from professional skills all the way through the skills gap across the entire industry. That comment I think is valid. David? I would echo Chris's point. It starts with STEM. It starts with what we're doing in terms of getting into the schools. Uh, Construction Excellence is doing that. Hinkley's doing that. Uh, we need to make the, the industry attractive. Um, and then once we get people into industry, we need to keep them. So at Hinkley, uh, the key for us is, is making it an attractive place to work. So we're working with our, our union partners, we've got union agreements to ensure that um, um, we, we, we attract people to the site. We want to put in place best-in-class accommodation. Uh, and then once we attract people to Hinkley, uh, we've developed with our contractors and employees a first unit which uh, is, all, is all about making sure once we get somebody on the site, uh, they stay at the site, they move on to other contractors. Um, so we've got, we've got to create the right environment, we've got to get into the schools. Once we get people into the industry, particularly with these bigger projects, as Chris has said, we've got a great opportunity to, to keep people there. And then we need a variety of skills in, in, in construction. We don't just need steel fixers mm. and electricians. Uh, we need a variety of, 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 of skills. So it's a, it's a great opportunity uh, to bring people in and at Hinkley we're trying to uh, bring 34% as I said from the local community but they're not all steel fixers many of them are uh, d d d different jobs and it's all about <laughs> attracting them uh, another area we're looking at is is with the armed forces there's a lot of people come out of the armed forces in the 30s and 40s uh, who, who, who want to work the physically fit the trained the disciplined uh, and again that's a really good uh, source people to come into the um, in, into um, into construction so I think we just need to cast the, the net a bit wider as well thank you David do you want to yeah just briefly uh, government can come up with whatever figures they they wish on construction be it a million the reality is there is no way a million homes will get built in that time scale because of skills shortage that's just a statement of fact it's just not going to happen unless there's a, a very different attitude taken towards immigration I think we all understand uh, where that one can go. The, the reality is, as we speak here today, house building in March, just gone, had its lowest output in historical records. So the actual outturn of houses being built, or starts on site anyway, is going, going in the opposite direction to what, what our government want. Uh, I think for Ian, for, for Ian and all of us in, involved in the industry, uh, there just isn't a short-term fix for it, and uh, I, I don't believe any of us would actually su suggest there is. One of the things Constructing Excellence have done, and uh, one of the things that companies like ourselves do as well, is it's actually about making the industry sound more exciting than what we actually promoted to actually be, and get youngsters both for, who are, are looking at uh, uh, university places uh, and degrees which cover construction and in the schools at an early day, stage, and particularly teachers in schools actually, who quite simply do not promote construction as an interesting and exciting career to go into. So there's a, there's a huge gap there, and Andrew in particular and others have done a lot of work. The industry is going to change. It is going to change very, very rapidly, be it off-site manufacturing, different techniques. Um, for example, I don't believe there'll be a new house built in five years' time that'll have a, a central heating system on it that actually has a, a thermostat or a timer that you have actually in your home now. I'm sure you've seen the products from the gas board, the hive. We're, we're building our first homes where you look a very affluent, rich lot. So when you get off the plane at Heathrow coming back from your, your skiing holidays, you'll be going on your iPhone and set your central heating and your hot water. So it's on when you get home. The technology will change very much actually how we run um, 
run our homes both in heating terms, uh, efficiency, but ultimately there isn't a fix, there isn't a magic uh, silver bullet that's going to produce another 200, 300,000 people to work in the construction industry, be it engineers, architects, surveyors, plumbers, etc. in the next four to five years. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from the floor? There's a couple over here. Um, lady in the middle and the gentleman at the front. I feel a bit like David Dimbleby. <laughs> Hello, my name is Phil Hodge. I'm the Southern Director for the Federation of Master Builders. And for those who might not know who the organization represents, uh, we represent mainly the SME sector of the construction industry right across the UK. And um, my observation is that over the last 30 to 40 years, the involvement of SME builders has gradually declined because, as you quite rightly say, the industry is changing. There's an increasing move now towards the mass production, the off-site manufacturing. And my question to the panel, it's probably to Ian, I'm sorry to pick on you again, but uh, anyone from the panel is very welcome to, to answer this one. Um, how do we assure the inclusion of somewhere in the region of 300,000 SME building companies into the industry? Um, how do we assure that they are part of it in the future? And what measures do you think they should be taking? It's, uh, I think it's a really, really interesting aspect of the whole issue of ramping up supply. Um, I, can, I can tell you, I think the government takes it very seriously that the expectations it can make of our volume house builders in terms of the, the number of homes they will deliver, um, I think they, they sense that there's, a, that there's a cap on the sort of industry sector appetite to go beyond a certain level. Um, and, and you can understand because it's, it's driven by a commercial return and if you go back to the Barker review, ramping up supply to a number that make homes affordable is not going to be supported by an industry that, 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 that makes its money out of, of seeing um, real price, uh, uh, price inflation in real terms. Um, I think the government is really, really keen, genuinely keen to uh, help to rejuvenate and rebuild a strong SME sector, um, particularly in, 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 in housing. The, the sorts of things they um, are encouraging us to do are to think very carefully about the way we package up and parcel land for, for release for development ourselves. We have had a habit over the last few years of taking quite large sites with maybe capacity for, for 500 or more homes marketing that site and entering into a single uh, development agreement with one major volume house builder, which then tends to last, you know, five years or more whilst those homes are built. Um, I think we will start parceling up lot sizes uh, and approaches not just to help um, uh, offer opportunities to, to smaller builders, but also we, we really want to increase the delivery of custom build housing in, in all its forms. Um, and those two areas together will really encourage us to be much more thoughtful about the way we, 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 we sell land. Um, the new home building fund, uh, the government has pressed us, you know, this is three billion pounds of finance to help um, uh, forward fund projects and provide development finance. Uh, the, the government's pressing us to make sure that we make full availability of that to smaller builders, often who would be seen to have a higher risk profile, but it's seen as a very clear government desire to really strengthen the sector. So I think there are a few emerging um, uh, you know, flames that, that we really must funnel. But I would like to talk to you because we would really like to get a better understanding of the, f the full range and, and um, contacts within the SME sector in the Southwest so that we can, can really um, market the opportunities to those um, when they come forward. Thank you. Could we have the question from the middle there? Thank you. Good morning, Denise O'Leary, Purple Marketing. 
We act as freelance bid writers in the construction sector, and I hear a lot from SMEs that struggle to, to make supply chains um, within your industry. And I noticed one of the points was made earlier on about what could be done with public procurement. So I'd be really interested to hear the panel's views on what we could do to change public procurement to make it easier for SMEs to partake. <coughs> Who'd like to take that one? <laughs> well, I'll come in first. I, I think the public sector, certainly in my experience, often actually use public procurement rules as a, as a means to say, well, if you're a small, a small business, you don't have the financial clout and, and you can't take part. And how we have to procure through a tendering situation means we will always go for the lowest tender, etc. And that very much works against uh, the SMEs. I think the reality in the public sector is how it actually works, it doesn't have to work like that, and there are many organisations in the, in the South West and nationally who actually will try and support the local supply chain, and particularly the local construction companies, for the very reasons that we've touched on, about creating apprenticeships or, or, or a range of training opportunities. So I would, I would personally, I'd say, well, do what the, the better public sector bodies do, which is look at price and quality, uh, if you're just getting the cheapest price, are you actually getting the best product? I think that was touched on earlier on. It's actually the final output that you're interested in. The, only, the total life cost should probably be part of the equation as well. So uh, there are ways of doing it, but um, the construction industry, and particularly procurement, is very, very slow, or some people are very, very slow to change and just do what they've always done until somebody tells them to stop. So it does need that change, and ultimately, that's what constructing excellence is all about. That's two adverts I've given you <laughs> to, Thank you today. Much, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? But we are running slightly late, so if, if you haven't, could, could we thank our panellists and speakers then from first thing? <laughs> we've got 10 minutes to... F oh, yeah, we've got some on the left. Good. So who's got the mic? Oh, thank you, thank you. We've got two hands up over there on my left. If you, again, if I could ask you to say your name company and then to whom your question is asked. Thank you. Uh, yes. Is this working? Here we are. Uh, Tom Green from SLR Consulting. It's a, it's a question for, for Deborah, but it possibly leads into the other, the other two on, um, on, on value. Is bimming up of existing estates you mentioned, um, that strikes me as huge. Yeah. <laughs> What do you want, and how on earth are you going to do it? As in putting a BIM model into the existing estate, you mean? Indeed. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, get, we can't do it in one big hit. Um, some some all private organisations are. Um, we will do it. As, as a, because the, the mandate actually says for, all new, for, for central government is that all new projects will have a BIM model, BIM level two. So as we do the projects, we will start building that BIM library across the estate. So it will take, a, it will take time, but it will build. Will it cover all parts of the build, or just the um, FN it, aspects? I think that that's we've got to take a view. Um, it also it depends on what the project is, um, because some of them we will do full BIM models and some will be BIM light. And I think it, it depends how significant part of the building. If it's a big part of the building, we'll try and do the whole building. Um, obviously, if we're only just doing a small part of it, then probably not. Um, so I think there's got to be taken a view each time um, as to whether we do it. But it is, it's got to build, and it's got to build gradually, but it certainly won't be overnight. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. And we've got a question just further forward here. Ni Nigel Stapleton from RISE. Um, I'm interested that we have asset management architecture and looking at the cost, but it seems that we've shied away from one word, and that is, a couple of words rather, whole life costs. Do we not have a responsibility in construction not to build and construct just for today, but in fact to undertake whole life cost analysis? We talk about cost benefit. Commercially, we're driven to make that decision and provide a cost benefit of today. But actually, we are building for the next generation and the next generation. Any comments, please, from the panel about whole life costing? I think that's a, that's a fascinating question, Nigel. And of course, whenever we go and uh, take a brief from a client, uh, we will say, so what are you going to use this building for? And they will always say, well, I've got these people who I want 
to occupy these particular rooms, these particular facilities. And then I quite like to cheekily ask them what are they going to use the building for in 10 years, in 25 years, in 50 years. And of course, nobody can answer that question. Uh, any business struggles to know what they're going to be doing in a year's time, never mind 25 years' time. And therefore, in order to think about whole life cost, we can't really think about the whole life cost based on today's steady state carrying on over that period. We need to think about how do we deliver buildings that are easily adaptable mm -hmm. to new and as yet unknown uh, uses going forward for 25 years. So it's a tricky question. It's a, it's a tricky question. It's not a steady state question. It is a moving target question. I think that makes it particularly difficult to answer other than by saying that every building pretty well needs to be adaptable to unknown uses. I'd actually agree with that. And um, it's interesting because when we've, 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 we've looked at this in uh, various cases and we try and put a whole life cost in, and it's, it's, the answers are exactly what, as you've said. Um, but then when we say, oh, well, we want to build in flexibility because actually we don't know what we, it will be and whatever, they say, oh, well, the cost is going to rise because you're going to build in flexibility. So <laughs> I think it shouldn't um, necessarily. And I think that's the bit we've got to challenge because actually by saying that as an industry, we're actually putting people off thinking about whole life. Yes, uh, I, I'd agree. I mean, a number of the projects that I've worked on, uh, particularly government projects, whole life cost models are produced. I, I can think of examples where we actually use that to drive up the amount of construction. We were looking at refurbishment projects, we went for more new build because the whole life cost model supported that. And I think part of that is also the conversation with the client as well as saying, how are you going to adapt to use the building? Sorry, how are you going to adapt the building for your future use? How are you going to adapt to use the building in future use? It's not just necessarily about changing the building all the time, it might be about changing the way you use the building to avoid doing it. And there are simple things that can be done, you know, not putting the services in all the walls, so you've got dividing walls <coughs> that are, are free of services, makes them much easier to move. Um, I'd rather do that than put up a, a folding partition that never gets used mm -hmm. and always breaks. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any more questions, ladies and gents? Nigel, while you've got the mic, um, if you'd like to just grab it back. Uh, Nigel and I were talking during the coffee break about the Q&A session that we were having previously and the chat about SMEs. And Nigel was commenting that when we talk about SMEs, we tend to migrate our minds to those on site. But actually, many SMEs uh, are indeed the professions. Nigel, do you just want to raise a point, and maybe we'll get some... Um, I questions, think, I if not from it, the panel, from the floor. I, I think you've done it in, an, um, in your own way, Andrew, right, very okay. well. <laughs> My point is, and I'm sure I'm not the only voice here, we alluded in the first part of our conference to SMEs in terms of contracting and building. That's fine, great. But I think there are also quite a number of organisations looking down the list here who are would regard themselves as SMEs and are in the supply chain in the construction industry. And I would just like us to think as a conference that we don't forget that a lot of larger organizations rely on the SMEs across a range of the skills that make up our industry. And uh, that was just the point I wanted to make. And uh, if I'm making the wrong point, I apologize, but I don't think I am. I am an SME, and therefore I feel that I should need to mention it. So let me, let me just switch it completely around then. What do you think Constructing Excellence should be doing for you in that role, what, or what could we do for you? I, I think actually, uh, Andrew, we, we're reaching the stage where one of the groups that we need to look at in terms of networking, it may be that we need to be looking at SMEs uh, and how we can interact. One of the questions that we had earlier was, was about how do we uh, link in to larger organizations and frameworks. And there may be, it, it's, it's tough. You know, let's, let's not make any bones about it. SME, breaking into a framework, breaking into a, with a large organization is tough work. I've been there, I've done it, and I'm doing it. However, I think 
there would be benefit in us being able to communicate more widely within the Southwest uh, in, in order to get that encouragement uh, across the board. We have um, in our audience somebody from the um, framework. Um, yes. Do you want to say a few words about that? Or we, just while the microphone's going across, uh, certainly, for example, EDF, uh, are very insistent that we work with the supply chain because many people in the supply chain who maybe hitherto were used to being tier one are now going to find themselves tier two, tier three. Uh, and culturally, that can be difficult and, and dictates a different way of operating, doesn't it? So I, I, I th it is a point that we've been discussing, and maybe, David Rennick, we ought to think about this as a specific topic at the next board meeting. Yeah. Sorry, please. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Mike Bukowski from the Southern Construction Framework. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I work exclusively in the Southwest. I'm very conscious of, of the issues in terms of local engagement, in terms of SME spend. I, I think the one thing I can add maybe to, to add, you know, may, maybe give some comfort to the questioner is that, you know, very good frameworks, and I can certainly speak for our own. Um, yeah, of course, we, we're engaging. The nature of a framework is we appoint you know, uh, a number of tier one framework contractors for a period of time. Some people think that that effectively locks down the market. But what we can do is we can actually use that influence um, to, to, to guide our contractors. You know, certainly the Southern Construction Framework, we've got very strict targets and KPIs in terms of local spend, SME spend, added value, social value. Um, another example, all of our contractors have to create apprenticeships before they've even won a job. Um, so, so actually, it's more about what you can do. And you know, no different to constructing excellence as a, as a representative body, what can we do to influence the industry and bring about positive change? So you know, there, there are measures in place. There are things we can do. Uh, certainly, I think it's a fantastic point that we, we also consider the wider uh, nature of SMEs. It's not just you know, the small brick layer or, or whatever. It, you know, a consultant, an architect's practice, you're all SMEs. Um, and, you know, I'm sure, you know, we've got a couple of our framework contractors here today. Um, you know, I, I'm sure we'll see that coming through in their bids that when we, when we challenge them to, to spend their money locally, they could certainly be including consultants in that, in that spend target. So, you know, that's, that's something we're very aware of and, and, and very happy to promote that agenda. Thank you. I, I could certainly, so, sorry, carry on, Deborah, please. I just want to add something to it. It's a couple of examples where um, in government where they've really looked at the whole SME space. And, um, uh, and I don't know how many of you are aware, but there's, a, there's something called G Cloud, which is about IT in government. It's essential government. Um, and it's like a, uh, they call it like a dynamic marketplace. And it's actually aimed totally at SME. They realise rather than having the massive IT suppliers, that actually a lot of SMEs, are, you know, the small individuals, small companies, are very much, that's where the, the innovation is in IT. So they've got this thing called G Cloud, and it's just like a preferred supplier type thing. It changes every year. It's really easy to get on, no big PQQs or anything like that. We're trying to do something in central government very similar to that for the FM space, because there's a lot of FM uh, in the FM industry. We've got a lot of very specialist providers that tend to be SMEs. So we're trying <coughs> to adopt something very similar. So my, my challenge to you is that as the construction sort of uh, body, you need to challenge the uh, central government to do something very similar in the construction space um, and set up something like a dynamic purchasing system or a dynamic marketplace or whatever they want to call it that enable, rather than just being in a supply chain, which you will still need, I know that, but there's also another avenue and, and give that second avenue. So challenge them and, and lobby them for that. I can see at our next board meeting, we're going to discuss maybe another couple of thought leadership forums, perhaps <laughs> one on professional SMEs and maybe one on FM. I, th I can see that <laughs> potentially happening. Andrew, okay. could, I, could I just add yes, something? Yes, of course, John. As, as, an, as an SME, <laughs> uh, there's uh, 35 of us in the practice, so we're definitely in the sub-250 SME uh, category. I think it gets up to clients to choose what they want. Mm -hmm. You know, a client might say, we want the nimble uh, service that an SME offers. We want the personal con contact with the senior people that an SME offers. Or they might say, actually, we want the big client of a multinational. It's a different service, and I think it's entirely up to clients to choose which one suits, suits them best. We are very happy being an SME, and we wouldn't want to be uh, a big uh, multinational. I'm sure there are plenty of multinationals and, and 
perhaps you know, Atkins, Facebook and Gould would, would say that, you know, that they have lots of assets <coughs> that they can bring, bring to projects that we can't. It's very much horses for courses. Yeah, I, mean, I suppose just to, just to add to that, although, yes, we are a, a large corporate body, uh, a number of frameworks that we're on require us to bring SMEs to the table, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, providing local, local knowledge, specialist skills that we can't provide. So I think you know, even for us, SMEs are important, and they're, they're an important part of our supply chain. Thank you. Any other questions? There's one, one down here, please. Who's got the mic? Ah, just, it's on the way. Yeah, just an observation, really. Alan Jarvey from Atkins. I suppose I'm a large multinational organization as well. Uh, but I think we offer the same service to our clients, whether we're an SME or not. We offer a personal service. You know, we, we offer local employees. Yeah, we, some of our offices might only be 10, 15 in size. In North Wales, for example, who do a huge amount of the local economy. Uh, even up to Bristol, we are a fairly large employer, but it's, it's generally local staff, you know. 80, 90 percent of our staff live within 10, 15 miles of the office, so we're very much a local organisation giving uh, a local service to our client as well. And very much as Andrew said, you know, a lot of our work, even if we're on larger frameworks, involve the use of SMEs. We don't provide all of the services ourselves. You know, we, we have a large supply chain and, and, and quite a collaborative approach in the way that we deliver uh, projects for our, our clients. It's our clients' needs at the end that we, we, we need to satisfy. So we. Uh, we pull together a, a team that best suits those needs, and that's not just Atkins services or FNG services. I can well believe that uh, a client the size of uh, EDF at Higley Point require a design team who can field hundreds of engineers, uh, and they might do it through an organization like Atkins by using people across the country and bringing their services together. That is simply the, a uh, provision that an SME cannot offer. You know, so I think that there is an advantage that a big organization can bring in that they can <coughs> offer uh, you know, local service, as you described, and also they can, they can pool their resource. We offer something slightly different, which is very much a, you know, a, a one-off, uh, one office to one client. I'm going to start charging for adverts in a minute, by the way. <laughs> uh, are there any other questions? Yes, one here, please. Um, Simon Weston, uh, Kendall King Scott. Um, just a question really for Deborah. I mean, I was in a, a meeting the other day with an internal project manager for a large unitary authority, and uh, he sort of took me on one side at the end and, and said, P -p please don't give us any Kobe data drops. And we just had a long discussion around BIM and, and, and project implementation and things. I'm just curious how, how can the sort of, given that we, we're clear where the cabinet officer are at, and, how will we, does that message get out? What, what is actually being done to try and communicate, particularly with, with local authorities who are you know, massive commissioners, to sort of break this, this sort of fear almost of, 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 of FM departments that are not quite there? And, and you know, is that actually a, a kind of dialogue that's starting? Or, or what can be done about that? central position from government to make that happen other than the mandate um, so we there's no further uh, push on that but th it's all about education and we really we, it's about getting the clients up to speed and the FM market up to speed and what does that mean and being ready to receive that data and why that data is important to them so this is a constant education 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 there's been quite a lot being done in the FM industry on that so both from BIFM and from RICS <coughs> Um, where we're really trying to, you know, up the ante with the FM industry on that. And it's been, so it's the industry that's pushing itself now, I think. Uh, it's been a very slow burn, agree. I think uh, they're definitely not there yet, but we've got to keep at it. Um, but we need as much uh, as we can get help to, for people to understand why that data is important and help, help them get ready to receive it, really, because it can be too much. But the other side needs to understand that as well, because there's no point just shoving a load of data at an FM and say, here it is. Because <laughs> it, it, yeah, you might have a bit in there that's quite useful. Um, so, you know, we've all got to work collaboratively on this and make sure that the, the data is useful and the data is meaningful and it goes into a meaningful way. That's, the, that's, the, that's why you have an aim, and that's what that aim should do. From, from a CE point of view, we have uh, offered all local authorities... Uh, complementary membership of our construction clients group and BIM 
and um, soft landings is, is very much one of the topic areas. Mm. But as you say, um, it's about education. We, we, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make it drink, so to speak. Are there any other questions? If not, could we please thank our speakers, panelists, in the usual way? Um, Kim Davies from Spella Metcalf. Um, this is for Emma, probably, and even possibly Andrew. Um, was searching or surfing the Twitter airwaves throughout today's conference, talking about careers in construction, and got a reply from someone who said, what do you do about getting disabled people into construction? Um, he's an advocate for it, and obviously there's a keen focus on careers on younger people, um, and that's perhaps a group that we don't talk about very often. Uh, there's obviously a, a wide range of disabilities that we talk about within that group. Um, but perhaps with Build Plymouth being such a big initiative and even the um, Construction Excellence Southwest, do you know of anything in place or do you have things in place that I could perhaps go back to that person and say they could use to help people either with funding or um, networking opportunities to help promote that? Hello there. Um, the, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think uh, some of the reasons for that are, bearing in mind the presentations we've had through the whole of today, it's, uh, a lot of it is around the awareness raising of the real <coughs> opportunities that can be suitable and appropriate for a, uh, a, a client group or a group of people with a variety of disabilities depending on where they are within that scale. So when, for example, parents or carers look and say, oh, well, construction's all about bricklaying or joinery, and my son or daughter is in a wheelchair, that's where it stops, common perception. Um, we're doing quite a lot, I think, through particularly the work that Emma is um, starting to unravel, uncover, in terms of the vacancies, the unpublished vacancies kind of thing, which is a lot of what's actually coming around. So the, there are those opportunities that are actually starting to be uh, discovered almost and, and that can help that cause. Um, the, the easiest thing to do, to be honest, is drop us a line and we can you know, follow it up further, further afterwards. But we're very aware of that. And I think the other thing is to advise them to go to the Go Construct website, goconstruct.org, because on there, there's 179 roles within this sector that's outlined. So again, they might sort of see that the barriers are not as high as perhaps are perceived. That might be another, uh, you know, identify the roles that are available because it's so broad. Um, I'm sure they could find something. But I am going to start doing some work with PLUS, which is sort of focused on the disabled um, people. So. That's definitely a part of the jigsaw of building Plymouth. It's just not quite got to it yet. From a CESW perspective, um, is, is Helen in the room? Helen Baker still? Helen. Helen's joined our board uh, recently. Um, and it, it actually came up last year's summit, didn't it, Helen? Um, we, as the South West, have, have added um, an award category to, to tonight's dinner based on the work we've been doing with Helen in the last 12 months which looks at things like inclusion and diversity. So I think we're making a start. Um, it's a journey, um, and we, we could probably do a lot more, if I'm honest, um, but it is on our agenda. I don't want to embarrass the other regions in the room, but at the moment, the Southwest is the only region that thought it appropriate to have an inclusion and diversity award. So I hope we're trend setting. But probably like the rest of construction, we're nowhere near where we should be, if it is an honest answer from my point of view. But we're doing, we've made a start. We've made a start. Okay, any other, any other questions from the, from the floor? Yes? Thank you. Hi, it's uh, Tim Jones. Uh, it, it builds uh, exactly on the theme you just started to, to open up on, uh, Andrew, diversity. Uh, and I think probably the question to, to Matt, there was an encouraging number of young ladies uh, in your photographs. Um, the... Um, uh, the ambition to grow the number of females in the construction industry has been uh, a frustrating process. I think we're still rattling around at one or two percent. Is there a lesson to learn from what you're doing, showing that this is becoming more of a white collar industry? Is there a magic bullet here that is emerging from the work you're doing? Well, certainly 
not a magic bullet. Um, we do still get predominantly boys at the school. Obviously, we've just been open a year, um, and we've got 85% boys. Um, we're working closely now and intend to work a lot closer with Southwest Women in Construction so they can help us improve the image of the industry to make it more appealing to girls. So that's one thing that we're doing that's proactive. Uh, next year's intake will probably be about 70% boys, 30% girls. And that's not too, too bad when you look at the industry overall. But obviously we're working harder, as I say, with, with SWIC to try and improve on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, question at the back. It's just really um, a comment. Um, recently, Considerate Contractors, I've been looking at some of their advertising material and the uh, Ivor Builder costume and campaign and have challenged them to think about their diversity because actually we have to take it through all of the supply chain. And I saw some stuff about, you know, invite Ivor Builder to your building site and hire the costume. <laughs> and um, I've, I've challenged them and I think there's a watch this space and he could have a partner. And I think that <laughs> will... Male uh, or female. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think the character was dressed in purple, so yeah. actually, <laughs> maybe Must the Must be the Pope. <laughs> um, but actually, that's the type of challenges we need to make. Uh, I went to a UCAS fair at the university a while back, and there were a number of um, figures that you could have your photograph taken in, and there was, as I would call it, a builder, a pilot, a spaceman. Um, and I went back to them and say, you know, every one of these actually says man to me, because if you look at a space suit, it's a space man. You don't think of a space woman. And I've actually challenged UCAS now to go away and change their advertising material because there wasn't a person in a skirt. There wasn't any long hair. Now, they say they were gender neutral, but I say to the average person who looked at those cutouts, they were all male and I've asked them to think about changing their marketing material. So I think it is about everybody challenging the stereotypes. I'm pleased to say on one of our sites, we've got a gentleman in a wheelchair. It's the first time I've seen a gentleman on site in a wheelchair. So it can be done. You just have to have the will to make the changes. It's interesting that you're having a, 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 con a conversation with considerate constructors, because I'm doing the same thing. Because I think it's somewhat bizarre that you have a considerate constructors badge on your site and yet you don't pay your supply chain on time so that's another area that um, I'm pushing from a CE point of view so that's interesting okay thank you um, Helen very much are there any other questions from the floor if not could we please thank our speakers once again